Okay. You're on. Okay. Well, firstly, uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Robert, and uh, thank you for all coming out. It's a great to see this level of interest in this issue. Um, I'm going to take. I'm going to build on what uh, Norm just introduced and 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 attempt a new narrative that says there's an opportunity here to think differently about the nature of the problem and we're really wise, we'd be very wise I think to take some elements of this seriously because there is hidden in this crisis a, a rather significant opportunity and I'll try to elaborate. Okay, so these are some shots of the flood of 2011 um, and the breach of the uh, Hoop and Holler Dam uh, or the dike there and I just want to convey that the increased frequency of flood events that we've seen is driving the nutrient loading on, of Lake Winnipeg. So the fact that we may be in a climate, climatically altered hydrologic situation, higher frequency floods, uh, higher frequency droughts, that, that accelerates the transport of nutrients to Lake Winnipeg as it sweeps off the agricultural landscape. So those are correlated stresses. This, this is a, builds on Norm's point. Um, although it's a very large basin straddling uh, two states primarily and four provinces, the nutrient problem is relatively uh, localized to uh, Manitoba, North Dakota, and Minnesota. There's a significant contribution from the Winnipeg River uh, and some from the Saskatch from Saskatchewan, but it's really uh, the U.S. and Manitoba that contribute the, lar the largest amount of nutrients to Lake Winnipeg. Um, and in Manitoba, two-thirds of the phosphorus load is non-point, which means it doesn't come out of pipes, it sweeps off the landscape. Some of it is natural, some of it is from agriculture. And it's just sort of what's what we call non-point watershed-based loading. That's the key thing, and it's tough. It's really tough to manage this. It's not like legislating a few pipes here and there, or in the case of Lake Erie, perhaps a few hundred. But it, it, it's not that simple. It, it's a, a more challenging cultural problem um, to regulate non-point nutrients. Um, so, and I'll, one other interesting feature of this phosphorus story is that the nutrient that we believe is responsible for creating these algae blooms is actually also a strategic resource. And uh, the United Nations Environment Program in a couple of years ago remarked on Lake Winnipeg as a very uh, illustrative example of the misuse of phosphorus. Basically, we were taking this strategic resource that's finite and, and, uh, and not managing it properly, allowing it to pass into the lake downstream where it fouls aquatic ecosystems instead of cycling this nutrient. Phosphorus, the molecule that, that, that uh, the atom that, that creates these algae blooms, is also in every molecule of your DNA. It's what makes food grow. It's a critical resource, and there's, there's concerns that we're misusing it. And, um, and so the United Nations Environment Program, in their wisdom, said, really, we need to explore much more innovative approaches to cycling phosphorus before it washes downstream and, and uh, pollutes Lake Winnipeg. And this was an image from uh, uh, algae bloom on Lake Winnipeg that the United Nations Environment Program used to make the point around phosphorus management. Um, and it comes from only a few places in the world. Morocco, for example, exports almost half of the world's uh, phosphorus supply. Okay, so what we, what we then envisioned was a watershed of the future where these nutrients are actually cycled and we use much more effective use of uh, targeted biomass to intercept these nutrients before they wash it downstream into, into uh, rivers and lakes and actually use that for ecological biomaterials production. We see, if you think about it correctly, and if you recognize that phosphorus is a strategic resource, there's an economic development opportunity embedded in this. So that's what we call the watershed of the future. And we deduced that we could actually balance the phosphorus load on Lake Winnipeg by some creative alternative uses of our agricultural landscape. Um, and this is an example, uh, some research we did um, in Netley Liebel Marsh on the shores of the south base of Lake Winnipeg, where we proved that harvesting ecological biomass produces multiple benefits. Um, phosphorus interception and recycling, nutrient capture, carbon capture, greenhouse gas mitigation when converted to a biofuel, and critically, we cycle the phosphorus 
the phosphorus can return to the agricultural landscape rather than flowing downstream. Uh, I'll just pound, we got some recognition for this. We also uh, demonstrated in the last couple of years that we can do this more generally in agricultural landscapes. This is a, a demonstration of intercepting phosphorus by harvesting ecological biomass. In this case, a species known as, as cattails, which is a luxury phosphorus user, just loves to, wherever it's wet, wherever there's loads of nutrients, cattails will appear. And it's a fantastic bioenergy uh, source. Great fiber qualities, uh, uh, great densification properties. It's a legitimate biomaterial. Um, we deduced that you can actually uh, generate very high economic values depending on the level of, uh, of um, processing that you apply to these materials. And just as a, uh, we're, in, we're in collaboration with several research institutes in the city to uh, produce higher value uh, biomaterials from this uh, ecological biomass that intercepts the phosphorus. Now, we think the future is when this combines with flood protection and, uh, and the bigger issue of a climate change altered hydrology. We think that we will need to go to much more distributed storage on the agricultural landscape as a flood protection measure, but also naturally as a nutrient management measure. And this is a, an image of a, a, a flood storage project in, in uh, Minnesota, in the Red River Valley, uh, where they're, they've got three sections impounded, and it's the cheapest way to provide flood protection for the city of Fargo. And what grows in there? <coughs> three sections of cattails. Uh, it's where the nutrients collect. They come with the flood waters and they collect there, and this was never cattail filled before it was impounded. Now it's filled with this, in principle, high value biomaterial. Um, this is a little too much detail, but we've done a, the investment case, and if you count the public benefits from flood mitigation, from water quality improvement, plus the private benefits of biomass production, recycled phosphorus, and so on, you've got a very attractive benefit cost ratio for this style of investment. Um, it's a different way of thinking about the agricultural landscape. It's part of what we call the watershed of the future. Um, we see a very, very favorable benefit cost ratio if you can count the public and private benefits. Now, to move in this direction, there's a bunch of policy threads which need integration. Uh, recently, I was part of the signing of the Lake Friendly Accord, which is a, a very ambitious and, and, and very well intentioned and hopefully very successful plan to uh, reduce nutrient loads uh, in cooperation with other jurisdictions and across three levels of government just in Manitoba. We've got the, the 2011 Flood Review Task Force, which reported in uh, May of last year, which recommended uh, distributed storage on the agricultural landscape as cheap flood protection. We've got the forthcoming surface water management strategy in this province, which we believe will have elements of, of these ideas. We've got a retention, a surface water retention study going on at the University of Manitoba. And we've got, and this is a, the novel piece, the Manitoba Biomass Economy Network, where another part of, uh, of provincial policy is to move us towards more biomass dependency for our primary energy. Uh, so that all needs thinking and integration. And the, just to, I'll conclude in some big picture what policy needs for Manitoba leadership on this issue. We think we need a legislative commitment at a high level to a financial instrument, to, to new economic instruments to push this agenda. It could be, and I'm not going to say definitively it has to be, but it could be a water quality trading system. I'll leave the examples from Alberta and Ontario for uh, questions. We also need, we believe, supportive policies for municipalities and other jurisdictions to de-risk innovative forms of water management. And we think we need an incubator for attracting companies that can add value to this system to develop Made in Manitoba solutions. Think I'm out of time? You are. You're right on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All done. I'll, I'll yeah. leave it at that then. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.